Hi everyone, welcome to Ask a Property Manager, episode number 83. Today is August 11th, 2021, and we're coming to you from Studio 2.0 here at Own Buffalo. I'm Andrew Schultz, Principal Broker of Own Buffalo, Inc. And on today's show, we're gonna be analyzing a rental property deal. We're gonna take a quick peek at the new infrastructure deal. We'll answer some questions from housing providers around the country and so much more. Before we jump into that, we're gonna go ahead and plug our social media. New episodes of Ask a Property Manager every Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Buffalo Foreclosed Homes. You can catch the replay the same day on Facebook and on YouTube. Don't forget about our Instagram. We post content there that doesn't make it to the other platforms. And last but not least, a new episode of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast drops tomorrow on Thursday. We're going to be taking a look at how to properly serve a notice to quit air conditioning units and who is responsible for the maintenance and collecting security, uh, social security numbers on a rental application, good or bad idea. Don't miss out on that. New episodes of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast drop every other Thursday morning over at rentprep.com slash podcast or anywhere podcasts are heard. We're going to go ahead and start with our news of the day here. And unfortunately, we have a couple of uh, not so great stories, and then we're going to take a look at that infrastructure bill. This comes to us out of Kentucky. Husband and wife killed in Richmond shooting, man in custody after standoff with police. Well loved by many in the community, police say Christopher and Grace Hager were shot and killed outside of an apartment building that they own on Keystone Drive, quickly after the suspect barricaded himself inside the apartment. The situation then took another turn after police say he set the apartment on fire. Police say 51-year-old Thomas Burl is now in custody. We're told they got the first calls to go, uh, excuse me, we're told they first got calls of the shooting around 2.30. After police arrived and discovered Burl inside the apartment, they tried for hours to negotiate with him to come out safely. The Keeneland to Aqueduct drive areas were closed off to try to keep people out of harm's way because, as police said, bullets could have started flying at any time. Once police had a warrant, they used rounds of powdered gas to smoke him out. While this was going on, he set a fire in the duplex, causing extensive damage inside. Smoke from the fire covered the entire street, but was quickly put out. Police say Burl then gave himself up and came out a window sometime around 6.30. They took him to a hospital in an ambulance as a precaution, but say he wasn't physically hurt. The sad news is we had a daughter who the coroner had to call before we got here and let her know that both of her parents are gone. That's not an easy call to make. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of those involved. Police Chief Rodney Richardson said, Police have not released a motive or what happened before the shooting. They also have not released Burl's charges at this time. We're told that Christopher Hager was 54 and Gracie was 52. They were prominent R Richmond business owners and well-known throughout the community. Several friends held a prayer, prayer vigil Tuesday night for the husband and wife. The Hagers own a Shell Mart near the EKU campus and other properties. Christopher was a realtor in the city. A uh, quick follow-up to that. This was posted just a couple days ago. Um, Chris and Gracie Hager were shot and killed last week. They were known for their missionary work and for the real estate business. Monday morning, the man accused of killing them, Thomas Burrell, made his first appearance in court. Uh, he appeared for his arraignment by video. He's facing several charges, including mercen, murder, arson, tampering with physical evidence, and criminal mischief. Police say he shot the Hagers outside an apartment complex they owned on Keystone Drive. Neighbors tell us he lived in the building with his girlfriend. It's not clear why the Hagers were at the apartment, but police say the couple planned on selling the building. Investigators are trying to figure out a possible motive. In court, not guilty pleas were entered on Burl's behalf. He told the judge he's a musician. The judge appointed Burl an attorney and set a $5 million bond. Family and friends of the Hagers were not in the courtroom, but Sunday night they gathered by the numbers. A celebration of life ceremony honored the couple. Those who knew them say they will be truly missed. You know it's only by the grace of God that I'm getting through it, said Mike Park, one of the friends of the Hagers. It was just so hard in the first days, just really so hard to think that they could be taken from us this soon. And then it goes on to talk about visitation. Burl declined an interview from jail. His preliminary hearing is set for August 18th. This is one of those stories that we don't necessarily know that this was a landlord-tenant dispute, but basically every indicator is that this was a landlord-tenant dispute. And now two people are dead as a result of it. And it's incredibly sad. Um, you hate to see this. I, I, there are a lot of people that are getting to the end of their ropes as a result of everything that's going on, whether it be the pandemic, whether it be you know, loss of a job, whether it be any of a number of factors, mental health in this country is at an all-time low and people are starting to get to the end of their ropes. And unfortunately, this is the type of thing that you start to see happening when you get to that point. 
Um, not to be unfair, there was also an article out of Las Vegas, I believe, where a landlord shot and killed two tenants. I didn't have a chance to pull that down for today's uh, for today's show, unfortunately. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. I'm not trying to paint this as this is a one-sided tenants versus landlords thing. It's definitely going in both directions, but it really does boil down to the fact that a lot of people are just at the end of their rope. It's, it's kind of sad to see. Um, moving on to something a little bit more positive. This article coming out of The Real Deal, uh, this is in regards to the new $1 trillion infrastructure bill and what it could possibly mean for real estate. Uh, or more importantly, what the next infrastructure bill could look like for real estate. Uh, the Senate on Tuesday passed a $1 trillion infrastructure package, then turned to a $3.5 trillion measure that could inter include more extensive investments in housing and changes to zoning policies. The infrastructure bill includes $550 billion for bridges, roads, high-speed internet, and other projects. The White House has billed the spending package as the largest ever investment in public transit. Under the measure, Amtrak received $66 billion, which is the most the rail service has received since its founding in 1971, according to the New York Times. There we go. The Senate is now considering a $3.5 trillion plan that Democrats hope to approve through reconciliation, a process that would not require Republican support. The resolution allows for up to $332 billion for housing and other investments. That could help fund $213 billion uh, fund a $213, $213 billion Biden plan, there we go, to build or preserve more than 2 million affordable housing units, other housing proposals in Biden's infrastructure plan, including an expansion of Section 8 housing vouchers and incentives for cities and states to eliminate exclusionary zoning could also make it into the larger plan. The Associated General Contractors of America, whose members benefit from the plan, uh, approved Tuesday, urged the House to pass it as quickly as possible. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has indicated that the chamber will not vote on the initial bill until the Senate passes the more extensive measure. Unfortunately, some members of the House want to delay action on the bipartisan measure until passing an unrelated partisan spending bill, said C Stephen Sander, the group CEO. The last thing Washington should do is hold a much needed bipartisan infrastructure bill hostage to partisan politics. The New York Housing Conference is hopeful that the bu budget legislation will ultimately include changes to the low income housing tax credit program. The group is advocating for a change to the program's so called 50% test, which requires 50% or more of a development to be financed through private activity bonds in order to be eligible for such, ta such tax credits. Because their federal government caps the number of such bonds New York can issue, the test limits av affordable housing construction. Reducing the threshold to 25%, would add 10,000 affordable housing units each year in the state, the group estimates. We have a housing crisis in this country. We certainly have a housing crisis in New York, said Rachel Fee, executive director of the New York Housing Conference. Getting around the state caps has to be a priority for New York. So doesn't sound like there was a lot in this initial $1 trillion bill um, geared towards housing. However, this larger $3.5 trillion bill sounds like there's some pretty decent sized carve outs there for housing programs and housing initiatives to help us, number one, um, deal with this housing shortage that we have. And number two, looks like they're looking to make some expansions in key areas such as Section 8 vouchers and things like that. So that'll be interesting to see if that winds up finding its way through Congress and into law. I guess we'll have to keep up to date on that. All right, so we're going to jump over and look at a couple of funny things, and then we're going to do a deal analysis. We're going to start with this one. I feel like I have pulled up so many carpets, not necessarily linoleum, but so many carpets in living rooms and found beautiful hardwoods that have just been covered over for no reason. When I saw this, I knew it had to find its way onto the show. Uh, the next thing we have is, whoops, another humorous image. I don't understand what was going on back in the day when bathrooms were designed and why people thought carpet was such a great idea in bathrooms. Um, but please stop. No carpet in bathrooms, no carpet in kitchens. As a matter of fact, we sold a foreclosure in Niagara Falls that had carpet in the uh, kitchen maybe two, three years ago now. And I just thought it was the weirdest thing to walk into a kitchen and see like, like shag carpeting. It wasn't like indoor outdoor. It was like a shag carpeting. It was so gross. So, all right, we're going to go ahead Switch back to desktop view here. We're gonna go ahead and do a deal analysis here. And before we jump into that, I wanted to let you know, you can grab a copy of the deal analysis sheet that I'm gonna be using here right at whatsdrewupto.com. Um, you can find that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my overlay on here. There we go. 
Um, you can find a copy of this spreadsheet over at whatsdrewupto.com. Just click on the button to grab my free deal real estate deal analysis spreadsheet. You're going to fill in your name, your email address. We're going to send you the spreadsheet right to your email. We're also going to include a video showing you how to use it. As a matter of fact, it'll probably be the video that you're watching right now uh, because we're going to take this snippet from our Ask a Property Manager episode and uh, make this the video that we use for showing people how to use this spreadsheet. So you'll probably get to see this all over again. That being said, we're going to go ahead and pull up the spreadsheet here. And this is the deal analysis spreadsheet. This is something that we put together and it's been iterated over the years, but I've had some version of this for a long time now. And essentially what it does is it gives you the ability to quickly analyze a rental property deal to make sure that you are getting the best possible deal or at least understanding what the deal is that you're buying into before you go ahead and sign on that purchase contract. You can see that there's a bunch of different fields in here. The yellow ones are for editing. The green ones can be edited, but you don't have to. And the orange ones have some sort of a formula in them, so you don't want to edit those. Otherwise, you're going to break the spreadsheet. Down here at the bottom, we also have a mortgage calculator, as well as an amortization table. Once you put your info into the calculator, it'll build out your table for you. We'll get to all that here in just a minute. I want to talk briefly about the property that we're going to be analyzing. We'll hop over to the MLS. Right now we're looking at the client version of this MLS listing. This is 716 Hopkins and Buffalo. This is one of our listings. As a matter of fact, if you watched last week's Ask a Property Manager episode, I already put this out saying that this was out and on the market. Uh, but this would be the printout that we would hand to one of our clients if we were to show them the property. Uh, this is the client full version. It gives you all the information on taxes, gives you the information on the apartments, how many heating units, electric meters, gas meters, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna take a minute and flip through the photos here just so you can get a feel for what this property looks like. So you have a good idea as to what it is that we're actually analyzing as we're going through. This is the lower apartment. This is the occupied apartment. She keeps a very, very nice apartment. She's been with us for several years now, which is nice. And now we're in the upstairs apartment. This one is vacant. It needs a little bit of turnover work to get it back on the market and get it ready to go. One thing you will notice is there is a big water stain on the floor here. This house is in need of a roof. That's one of the things that we are going to be taking into account when we do our analysis. Um, some more photos of the upper unit. I like the upper unit because it has a big open living room, dining room area. It's a little bit different style than the downstairs unit, but otherwise the units are pretty much identical, the bedroom sizes and things of that nature. And there you have it. We have separate gas meters. We have separate electric meters. We have separate hot water tanks. We have separate furnaces. We have separate electric panels. And these are both 100 amp electric panels. So I went ahead and uploaded a bunch of photos there so that if somebody was trying to analyze a deal, they could get a lot of information just from the photos and from the MLS listing. Um, a couple things to make note of here. Updates on this property include two hot water tanks in May of 15 and March of 16, and two high efficiency furnaces in October of 13 and in October of 20. Um, so you do see that there have been a couple of updates there. Again, that's something to factor in, not necessarily um, not when we're talking about analyzing the property, if I knew I had to replace furnaces and hot water tanks, I would be including them in my repair estimates. Um, but in this instance, there's not really going to be an adjustment for those because they're in good condition and we don't need to make the adjustment. List price on this property is $120,000. That's the price that we're going to start at while we're doing our analysis. We're not going to sit and go and look at other properties in the neighborhood today to see if this is a good value for the neighborhood. We're going to be looking at this property as a standalone to see if it stands on its own two feet. So we're going to be jumping back and forth between this MLS listing and the spreadsheet quite a bit here, but I'll kind of go through and show you how to use this spreadsheet. So the property address, 716 Hopkins, uh, Street, Buffalo, New York, 14220. Purchase price is going to be $120,000. Total repairs needed. I know that we need a roof, and I know that that roof is going to cost us about $15,000. I'm going to throw that number in there. That gives us our total investment cost of $135,000. Actual cash invested. This is going to be your down payment and your repairs. In this instance, I'm going to assume that we're paying for the roof in cash after the closing of the property. So that's gonna be added in as just the flat 15,000. If you were financing the roof, um, then you would only be factoring in your down payment here. Your actual cash invested for that repair would be just your down payment in that instance. 
uh, for the purposes of this spreadsheet. So on this purchase price, we're gonna say $120,000. We're gonna say that you are putting 20% down, which is $24,000. We're also going to say that you're spending the money on that roof out of pocket, the 15,000. So we're talking about an actual cash invested of $39,000. $39,000, there we go. As far as the units go, we do not have any studios or one beds. We have two two beds. No threes, no fours. You really only have to put in the number of units for where you have units. I don't have to enter those zeros in. We just did it to make life a little bit easier and to show off the spreadsheet. So we're gonna, an an excuse me, we're gonna analyze this a couple different ways. We're gonna start just by analyzing it as it sits right now today with the one unit occupied based on the uh, based on the one unit currently being occupied. And then we're gonna see, okay, what are some other ways we can look at this to know if this is going to be a performing asset moving forward. Property taxes, we're gonna go back to the MLS. The total property taxes here are $1,111. I know those numbers to be valid because I gathered those numbers. So I'm gonna go ahead, jump back to the spreadsheet and drop my property taxes in here. Uh, electric and gas, I'm not factoring in for electric and gas because the two units each have their own electric and gas meter that the tenants are responsible for. Water and sewer, I'm gonna factor 800 in here. Um, and you can see I've left some notes behind. Most of this is geared towards analyzing a deal here in Buffalo. You could very easily change these, you know, these footnotes here. You could very easily change these footnotes to, to work in whatever region you're in. So I'm factoring in 800 for the water and sewer bill. And I am gonna factor in again, 200 a year for the user fee. Um, cable internet or other, we're not including any of that here. So I'm not gonna factor that in. I'm gonna factor in zeros for my uh, electric and gas as well. Vacancy, I like to see an eight to 10% vacancy factor on smaller buildings, duplexes. When you start to get into larger buildings, and by the way, this spreadsheet can analyze larger buildings. You can analyze, I believe up to 20 doors on this spreadsheet. Um, we're just using it for a duplex today. You, as the number of doors grows, the vacancy percentage should shrink. It's basically just working off the number of units in the building. You should have fewer vacancies at any given time if you have 20 units um, versus if you have two units. You know, it's it's a much bigger concern to have one vacancy on two units than it is to have one vacancy on 20 units. That said, vacancy, I'm gonna factor 10% of the gross annual income. So for this one, vacancy, I'm gonna factor in 900. For insurance, I'm gonna factor in 1,000. That's probably a pretty good number as to what you're gonna be looking at for insurance on this duplex. And that's just based on knowledge of the market and what insurance costs are. Maintenance and CapEx, I'm gonna go ahead and throw another 900 in there and another 900 for management. I'd like to factor 10 to 15% in for maintenance and CapEx. If it's an older building like what we're dealing with here, you might wanna go on the higher end of that when you're talking about maintenance and CapEx. Um, if it's a brand new build, you might be able to go lower. You might be able to go down as far as low as 5%. And again, when you're talking about larger buildings, those numbers are going to trend down versus trending up because you're going to have more units to offset um, those maintenance and repairs. Same thing with management. Uh, management should be considered 10% of gross rents on a duplex, ranging down to perhaps 5% on larger buildings. The more doors you have in one location, the lower your management fee is going to go. Landscaping and snow removal, I'm gonna factor 360. I'm basing that off 30 bucks a cut. Uh, and if you do the math on that, we'll pull the calculator back up here. 360 divided by 30 a cut, that's 12 cuts. If you're cutting once every couple weeks, which is what we try to do. Usually we are a little bit more frequent at the beginning of the season, a little bit less frequent as summer heats up and the grass starts to, uh, or slows with its growth pattern. You can see that there'll be times when you don't necessarily need to run back and cut it every single week. So we factor in for about 12 cuts a season. Uh, I'm not factoring anything else in for my other. And then we get into mortgage payments, principal and interest only. That's where you jump over to your mortgage calculator. You have your purchase price of 120,000. Uh, we'll leave that interest rate at 3%. Actually, now let's bump it to 4% just to make it a little bit more realistic. Uh, duration of loan in months, 360 months, that's 30 years. The loan amount, we're gonna say that this is a 20% down mortgage. So $120,000 times 0 0.2 is $24,000. 120 minus that 24,000 is 96,000. Your loan amount's gonna be for 96,000. 
All right, now that you've got all this in, we'll change our loan start date to, we're gonna say that we're closing on this 9-1-2021. You can see you've got your monthly loan payment. You've also got your total monthly payments, your total loan payments, your total interest paid, your monthly property tax amount. So if you wanted to, and there's a reason I'm not doing that here, because we want this to be a principal and only payment. We don't want the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance all wrapped into this because of what we're doing with this spreadsheet. I want my taxes split, split out separately. I want my insurance split out separately. I don't want those lumped in here, which is why I'm not taking my property tax. You could, you can take your 1111, divide it by 12, your property tax is gonna be 93 bucks per month. You can drop that in here and that'll give you your yearly loan and your monthly loan factoring in the taxes. I don't want that right now. I want just the flat principal and interest. And we can see our yearly loan payment is gonna be $5,500. Taking a quick look at the, oh, why didn't my amortization table do its thing? Total monthly payments. There we go. Now let's take a look at the amortization table. There you go. So you do have to have at least a zero in the monthly property tax amount in order for that to calculate. But you can take a look. You have a full table here. You can look at every payment all the way through from inception to end, all 360 months if that's what your heart desires. Um, but really the number I want right now is that yearly loan payment of 5,500 bucks. So we have our mortgage payment, principal and interest. We have our Typical expenses factored in here. We have our property taxes. We know what our rent is. Uh, let's come up here. Per unit investment, divide by zero. What am I missing? Did I forget to fill something in here? <laughs> oh, there it is, total units. I forgot to fill in the total units. Total units of two, occupied units of one. I missed one of my own fields. Now you can see that this property in its current state, not a real winner. Um, you're not winning in any of these categories. You're negative on your cash on cash return. You've got a really crappy cap rate and your debt service coverage ratio is not even gonna be something where the bank will look at this property. So we're gonna have to look and see what we can do to beef these numbers up a touch. So factoring all of that in, what exactly are these things up here? What are these criteria? What does all this mean? I left some notes over here on the side so that you can get a feel for what you're looking at. Cash on cash return is factored as the net operating income minus the, or I'm sorry, divided by the actual cash invested. Typically most valuable in finance transactions, this figure does factor in the mortgage payment, principal and interest, as well as taxes and insurance. That versus your cap rate, your cap rate is factored as net operating income without the mortgage divided by total investment cost. Since the net operating income does not factor in debt payments, the cap rate ignores the impact of financing. This is typically most valuable in an all cash transaction. Debt service coverage ratio, is factored as the net operating income without mortgage divided by the mortgage payment. This is often looked at by lenders before making a loan. Generally, lenders want to see at least a 1.2 DSCR. The DSCR shows by how many multiples you can cover the debt service after taking care of all operating expenses. Higher DSCR means less risk for you and for the bank, uh, and they want to see at least a 1.2. So in this instance, you don't even come anywhere close to that. So. We're gonna do a couple things here to further analyze this property. Um, first off, I'm gonna change this rent to 775. The reason I'm going to do that is because I know that that rent is going up in October of this year. We already have a new lease signed with that tenant for another year, jumping up to 775 from the current rent of 750. I'm also going to assume that, actually, let's just leave that. We're gonna just leave that. We'll make that alteration. When you make that alteration, you do have to come down and factor in the changes to your management, to your maintenance, and to your vacancy as well, so that your numbers stay consistent across the board. Your mortgage isn't changing, your property taxes aren't changing, your insurance isn't changing, um, your water sewer, your user fee, you know, there's only a couple factors that are changing here. So when you can make changes to the rent roll, um, it definitely has a major impact on whether a property makes sense or doesn't make sense. Right now, I want to look at this property as if you were going to buy this and owner occupy it. You are going to have the uh, the downstairs tenant take care of the rent, essentially, um, 
they're going to pay rent and you're going to live in the upper unit. So you're going to have $775 a month coming in here. Uh, let's jump back to our mortgage calculator and we're going to say, okay, 92, we'll call it $93 per month means your total monthly loan amount is $551 a month versus the rent that you're receiving of $775 a month. You're profitable on this property every single month, which is not a bad position to find yourself in if you're looking to owner-occupy this property. If you were to buy this as an owner-occupied property, the cash on cash return, the cap rate, the debt service coverage ratio, not quite as important as if you were using this as a true investment property. Um, you're going to be taking a standard you know, residential mortgage on it, no problem. And as a matter of fact, if you were going to own or occupy it, chances are you're not putting 20% down. You're probably gonna go with a 5% a or a 10% conventional product. You might be in on a 3.5% FHA. You might be in on a 0% down VA loan, which will definitely change these numbers if you're looking at this as a single family, or excuse me, as a, uh, an owner-occupied rental. So that is an option. And even if you were putting 20% down and you had to pay for that roof, you could still see that your monthly mortgage uh, is only gonna come out to that 551 bucks a month. So in theory, you should still be fine if you were looking to use this as an owner-occupied rental property with a tenant helping to support the rents. Um, now what I wanna do is say, all right, what if we can get both apartments at 775? And we're gonna say that both units are occupied. Now we need to come down here. We're gonna make some edits to our other numbers, our vacancy, our management capex, 1860. And what I'm doing is I'm taking this gross annual income times 10% essentially. Um, makes a real easy math. So now that we've adjusted for our maintenance, our management, our uh, vacancy, what do the numbers look like? Okay, suddenly we're starting to look a little bit better. The cash on cash return is actually Worth, worth looking at. Your cap rate is actually worth looking at. And your debt service coverage ratio, if this was to be at 775 for these two units, you know that the bank is gonna be willing to finance this based on this deal. With two tenants in place at 775 a month, this deal will stand on its own two legs. That's good news. Um, now let's really think a little bit more deeply here. Is 775 actually the true market rent? I don't think that it is. Based on my knowledge of the rental market in South Buffalo, I think you could actually go higher on this. I think you could probably get both of these units for $8.50 a month. You might have to do some turnovers. You might have to do some improvements and things like that. That's going to factor into your total repairs and things of that nature. Uh, but for this instance, we're going to leave those numbers alone. We'll take a look at what happens when you really beef those numbers up and get this thing back to actual market rents. We'll update our numbers down below. Everything else is gonna remain the same here. You can see your estimated expenses and coming up here, you see your updated cash on cash return, your updated cap rate and your updated debt service coverage ratio. Almost a 2.0. A 2.0 means that you can pay for all of the expenses of the property uh, on the debt service coverage ratio. Coming back here, net operating income without the mortgage divided by the mortgage payment. Essentially, this is how many multiples you can, uh, how many times you can cover the debt after taking care of your operating expenses. So that's all your operating expenses, which is all of this, minus your mortgage. That's what you're looking at on your DSCR. Essentially, how many times over can you cover the expenses before you get to the point where you have to cover your mortgage? You're in real good shape on this property. A bank would have no problem financing this property at almost a 2.0 debt service coverage ratio. So that's good news. Um, pretty straightforward. This is a very, very useful spreadsheet, especially in today's market, given the fact that you are dealing with a whole bunch of different, we're gonna switch back to this view. There we go. You know, given the fact that the market is moving as quickly as it is, it's nice to know that you can analyze a deal in literally minutes using this spreadsheet. Um, it's very, very, very straightforward to be able to use that spreadsheet to do a deal analysis. And you can know within minutes whether a deal is going to be the right deal or the wrong deal. Um, or if it's the right deal, or maybe it's not quite the right deal, what is it going to take to make it the right deal if I have to throw an extra X number of dollars at it, or I need the rents to get to this amount. You can really use this to analyze a, a deal in its current situation and then look at, okay, a few different factors, you know, 
what does this look like if I bump the rents up? What does this look like if I get better financing? What does this look like if we eliminate some of these expenses or whatever the case may be? It's a very, very, very easy way for you to be able to sit and actually analyze a deal properly. Uh, once again, don't forget, you can grab that spreadsheet for free over at whatsdrewupto.com. Grab a free copy of the real estate deal analysis spreadsheet. You can click that button right there. You'll enter your name, you'll enter your email address. We'll send you a free copy of that spreadsheet. Feel free to use it to your heart's content. That's what it's there for. We're going to go ahead and jump around to our questions from housing providers around the country. Starting with this one. Uh, do you have to accept a cosigner? Hi, I'm in California and I'm wondering, can you decline or reject applications that require a cosigner? Thank you in advance. I don't know of any state law in any of the states. I'll preface this by saying I'm not an attorney. Um, I don't know of any state law that requires you to accept a cosigner. If you have a written set of criteria for your rental, you know, selection criteria for your uh, rental, and they meet fair housing standards, you're compliant with all the fair housing guidelines, uh, and that application does not meet your standards, you don't have to rent to them. I don't know of any state that requires you to offer up cosigners as an option to anyone, at least not at this current junction. Um, if you are in a state that requires you to offer up a cosigner, let me know down in the comments because I would be interested to know what states are making that move, what they're requiring, and why they're requiring it. That was a pretty easy one. We're going to take a look at another question here. This will be our last one of the day as we're starting to go a little bit long here. Two tenants, one lease, one rent. Hello, I have a couple that splits their rent 50-50. One of them has a drinking problem and is now being late with his share of the rent. The other one is not happy. I can smell a split up coming. Uh, this one-year lease is on, excuse me, the one-year lease is in both their names and expires March 2022. What do you do when one of the tenants does not fulfill the terms of the lease and or they want to separate? I believe that neither one could afford the rent on one's own. So I will preface this by saying that hopefully your lease includes language that the tenants are jointly and severally liable for the lease. Again, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding of this means that if one party is unable to pay, the other parties in the lease must pick up the slack. And I understand that that is a massive oversimplification of a legal concept. You can talk to an attorney to get more information on it or go do some research on Google, whatever your, whatever your preference is. So in this example, even if they were to split up and one of the people was to move out of the apartment, they would both still be responsible for that lease because they both signed on the lease as responsible parties. Uh, it's not as though just because they break up and one person decides to move that suddenly they don't have any responsibility of that lease any longer. They signed it, they're responsible for it for the entire duration of that lease. Um, your recourse in this instance would be some sort of a court case. If someone stops paying rent, you could go the small claims route and try to collect the rent in the small claims court. Depending on where you live and what the eviction moratoriums look like, you could also do something along the lines of an eviction if that's something that would be permissible in your area. Um, one point that I tend not to bring up here, and it's something that I was reminded of by Steve White, the CEO over at Rent Prep the other day when he and I were having a conversation, Principal becomes expensive very, very quickly. So if this is a drag these people through the mud type of a situation for the sake of dragging them through the mud and you know that you're never going to collect on this, on this back rent, this past due rent, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to go through that headache? And you're going to spend more money because you're going to wind up court costs and everything else on a judgment that even if you win it, are you ever going to get to collect it? So that's something to keep in mind. Some people will pursue it all the way to the end regardless. Some people, it's case by case. Some people just say, this is not worth it. I'm not going to bother pursuing this. Um, principal gets expensive very, very quickly, especially when you start talking about the legal system and bringing in attorneys and filing court cases and pursuing people and then trying to actually enforce the judgment once you have it. Is this a situation where you're better off saying, okay, you know what? This isn't working. You guys are starting to pay late, pay late rent. Is this a situation where it's time to say, would you guys be willing to move out? This is no longer working and, and kind of go from there. That might be the better option here as opposed to trying to pursue an eviction or something like that. If you can kind of nip it in the bud before it gets to the point where there's a big back balance, that's probably the better solution here. Um, that would probably be the route that I would go. 
Anyway, that pretty much wraps things up for this week's episode of Ask a Property Manager. Thank you all so much for watching. I truly do appreciate it. I love producing Ask a Property Manager, and you can help us to improve by dropping a question in the comments either on Facebook or on YouTube, and your question may be picked up and answered in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed this content or if we brought some value to your day, do us a favor and hit that thumbs up button. YouTube and Facebook both push videos based on community feedback, so every like, comment, subscribe, and share helps us to grow and reach more people. Uh, we'll be back next week on Wednesday, August 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern with another show you won't want to miss. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.